Good morning, everybody. Hello. So nice to see you all. Um, just going to, yep, there is the, the first speaker, just to make sure. Uh, dear Foreign Minister, uh, parliamentarians, ambassadors, all guests. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this open sem seminar hosted by the Institute of International Affairs, the Icelandic Human Rights Council, and the, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And thank you so much for not letting the amber weather alert preventing you from joining this important dialogue on human rights and the role of small states in the global arena. Although the weather forecast is terrible, I expect today's discussion to be anything but. Uh, my name is Sveinn Gudmason. I'm a press officer at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. I will be uh, moderating the discussion for the first half, so to speak. But uh, in the second half of today's program, my colleague uh, Maria Mjöll Jónsdóttir will take over the moderation. Uh, the Human Rights Day is observed every year on December 10th to commemorate the day in 1948 when the UN General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. As most of you know, 
Iceland will finish its term as an elected member of the UN Human Rights Council in only three weeks. I think it is safe to say that during its term, Iceland, with other larger countries, has put important issues on the agenda of the Council, including leading a resolution on the human rights situation in the Philippines and a joint statement on Saudi Arabia. Therefore, it's no coincidence that uh, today's keynote speaker is a Saudi activist, Lina Al-Hatlul. She is widely known for her relentless advocacy to free her sister, Lu Jane, who was imprisoned in 2018 for protesting against a female driving ban. Panel discussions with four distinguished participants and three commentators will follow Lina's speech whom I will introduce shortly. However, before I give the floor to our keynote speaker, I would like to welcome to the stage Guðlu Thór Thórðarsson, Iceland's Minister for Foreign Affairs. Ágæta <laughs> sangkoma. Í dag fögnum við alþjóðlegum degi mannréttinda. Dagsetningin 10. desember tengist í vafalítið að það var á þessum degi fyrir 71 ári síðan sem allsegra þing samlöðu þjóðana samþykkti mannréttinda yfirlýsinguna eitt af grundvallar skjölum í gjörvallri sögu samtakana. Á næsta ári fögnum við 75 ára ammali samlöðu þjóðana Þeirra tímamóta verður minnst með ímsum hætti og vafa lítið verður starf samanlegu þjóðina í þá um mannréttinda í stóru hlutverki. Þar höfum við Íslendingar góða sögu að segja. Staða mannréttinda á Íslandi er góð í samanbyrðið við önnur lönd þó lengi megi gott bæta. Mannréttindi hafa líka verið leiðaljós í utarengistefnu Íslands og Íslands stjórnvöld hafa lagt sig fram um að vera hvarvetna málsvarar mannréttinda. Það á ekki síst við undafarna átjá mánuði sem Ísland hefur átt sæti í mannréttaráði samanlegu þjóðana. Ágætu gestir, distinguit gest, Ísland vil end its 18 month term on the Human Rights Council in only three weeks time. It has been a privilege for us to serve on this body, the primary global forum for discussing human rights. It has also proven to be a challenge, but a challenge we feel we have embraced, fulfilling most of the goals we set ourselves in the beginning. In particular, we promised to, to prioritize gender equality and women's human rights, LGBTI rights and the rights of the child. We also raised certain country situations that we felt had been neglected. We continued to lead on the issue of human rights in the Philippines with a resolution on that topic passing in the Council in July. We furthermore took the lead on human rights in Saudi Arabia when we delivered in March of this year on behalf of 36 states the first joint statement in the Council on Saudi Arabia. The joint statement raised the issue of the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi and more broadly addressed the lack of respect for women's rights in Saudi Arabia. The joint statement mentioned specifically 10 human rights defenders, nine women and one man, who were in prison at the time of the joint statement. It is a great privilege for me in this contest to note that with us here today as our main speaker is Lina Alhala Thul. Her sister is one of the 10 mentioned in the joint statement in the Human Rights Council in March. Lujian Alhala Thul became a world famous a few years ago when she, a woman, dared to drive a car in Saudi Arabia. Something that was until last year strictly forbidden by the Saudis authorities. Lina will be telling us more about her sister's case and her own battle on behalf of her sister. 
Lutian. I just want to say that I applaud Lutian courage and Lina's own courage. We all hope sincerely that Lutian will soon be released from prison as well as all other human rights defenders like her. Hearing Lina's story helps us to appreciate how far we have come here in Iceland. We have work to do at home in the field of human rights, but we must also sometimes remind ourselves that we are privileged in so many ways, and that we and others must speak out on behalf of those human rights are violated. Iceland may not be the most populous member state of the United Nations, but we have a voice and we should use it. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the things we wanted to do here today was to invite a few distinguished guests to discuss the current global situation in terms of human rights and to di discuss what small states like Iceland can reasonably be expected to accomplish when they are elected to the Human Rights Council. One question that immediately comes to mind and which I am sometimes asked is whether it makes any difference when a number of states join forces to criticize or raise concerns over the human rights situation in a particular country. The pessimist is likely to say no. That addressing matters in multilateral fora, such as the Human Rights Council, makes no difference at all. That is just all just talk. Others have argued that by keeping a particular situation on the agenda of bodies, such as the Human Rights Council, one is making sure things do not deteriorate even further at worst. And at best, one is helping putting pressure on government to improve conditions to change the policies and approach. On the Philippines, I heard the latter argument from people such as Mar Maria Ressa, the respected journalist from the Philippines who was here in Iceland recently. She thanked us for our leadership on that issue and argued that otherwise people such as herself would have been fighting alone and would be more exposed to various threats than they already are. That's enough for me. On Saudi Arabia, it is a fact that authorities there have in recent months appeared to be making moves to changing their approach. They have announced that some of the Saudi Arabia's most restrictive guardianship rules that stipulate, for instance, that a woman cannot travel without the approval of a male relative will be abolished. They have also recently made it possible for women to drive vehicles under certain guidelines. These are positive developments, even if these seem to us to like a very small steps. What we should remember is that it, it is by no means certain that these changes would be taking place if the global community wasn't watching the situation in Saudi Arabia closely. Maintaining pressure is so important. Trying to convince the government is both right and just, as well as beneficial for the society to guarantee human rights for women. In that effort, Iceland's voice can sound as loud as any other. What we also need to remember is that Lutin al Thul is still in prison, and so are many others like her. Although so Saudi authorities seem to be moving in the right direction, much more needs to happen, and we should help that change take place. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all in particular our foreign participants for being with us here today. I hope and trust the discussion will be both interesting and enlightening. Last but not least, I want to say happy Human Rights Day. Thank you so much, Kuelur.
Guðlaur is attending a cabinet meeting a little bit later on, so we will all apologize that he has to leave in a few minutes' time. But uh, now I would, I'm very honored to uh, invite here to the stage Lina Ad Hatul. I've already introduced her, so I don't have to have any more words about that, but welcome. Good morning, everyone. First, thank you for having me. It's, it's really an honor for me, and um, to be able to be the voice of my sister, it's really touching. So um, I'm the sister of Lujain al Hadlul, who's here. Lujain al Hadlul is a um, female activist in Saudi Arabia. She was, so she had three main fights. She first started with the, um, being the leader of a driving campaign where she was asking on social media for women to drive and to encourage and basically show that the laws are not against it. The, in Saudi Arabia, there's nothing that forbids women to drive. And so in 2014, I was, and she was also part of the, um, the, the campaign that um, asked for the end of the male guardianship system, which is basically in Saudi Arabia, women are minors till the end of their lives, which means that um, for every decision in their life, they have to have the, the approval of a man, which is first the, the father, when they get married, it's the husband, and sometimes it's even the son when they're divorced. And so she, she sent a petition to the king for this, and she was also in the process of opening a, a shelter for women who are victims of domestic violence, because the only thing that there is in Saudi Arabia for women um, who are victims of domestic violence is what they call the care home, which is basically a prison where um, they can't even leave it with a male guardian accepting um, the women to leave, and when they flee, they go to this, and it's really a prison. And so basically, this is the, the timeline, and I'll start with the, the first time she got in prison in 2014. So part of the driving campaign was um, when she tried to cross the border between the Emirates and Saudi Arabia in 2014. They arrested her and imprisoned her for 73 days. When she got out of jail, she understood that the, the problem is not only about driving, it's about the whole guardianship system. And that's when she really broadened her, her fight and started the campaign for the, um, against the, the male guardianship system. She, she collected, um, I think, 14,000 um, signatures uh, to the petition. And um, after this, she got um, arrested many times in Saudi Arabia, but for a couple of days. But it was fine, nothing so as worse as uh, what is happening today. In uh, March 2018, she was kidnapped of the streets of the Emirates, flown back to Saudi Arabia, and uh, she was banned from traveling. They did tell her why she was kidnapped, why they would, uh, they would want her to stay in Saudi, and she, she was just staying at home. In May, so a couple of months later, that's when they took her uh, from our house in Saudi Arabia, and she basically disappeared for a couple of uh, weeks. And then we found out that uh, she was uh, taken to um, a, a prison in Jeddah, so very far from our hometown. And she didn't have any charges. Uh, there was no warrant for her arrest. Nothing was being said. So w Saudi authorities wouldn't tell us anything. The only uh, information we had was what the media was saying, which is basically labeling her as a traitor in the newspaper. She, it was really something crazy. But officially, she didn't have any charges. Um, for 10 months, she didn't have any charges. And then they started the trial in March 2019. And when we see the charges, it's very weird because it's basically her activism. So they charge her with, uh, for applying at the job at the UN, for being in contact with foreign journalists, for being in contact with foreign diplomats, for, for uh, being part of the, women, uh, the feminist movement. And so her trial started. Um, she had three sessions of the trial. Uh, the fourth one got canceled. We don't know why. We don't know when the, ses the next session will be. And um, she's been in solitary confinement since April. And so we don't have any information about anything. Um, so the thing is, what I want to say is that, yes, there are changes in Saudi Arabia now. But the biggest problem is that it's becoming a police state. 
uh, people are in constant fear. There is no voice anymore for anyone to, to speak, to think. Uh, everyone is silenced. Um, we have the, 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 there's also brutal tortures in prisons that haven't been, that weren't um, like this before. For example, Lujain was even taken out of the official prison to an unofficial prison where it's basically a palace and she was tortured, she was, been, she was waterboarded, she, ha she was flogged, she was deprived of, of sleep, she was sexually harassed. I mean, it, it was really something we haven't seen in Saudi prisons before. And so um, I think, yeah, I'm sorry. Lujain, yeah, so this is the end. Lujain is, so, is in solitary confinement since. And yes, people have been talking a lot, a lot about it, which is very good. But I think it's not enough. And this is why I really would like um, to thank Iceland for having um, taken such a strong stand uh, on this case. And I think, um, and I, I, I also want to assure you that it has a positive impact. I mean, I, I understand that, that sometimes we're not really sure about what we're doing, but I do want to assure you that it's the right thing to do and that we do see changes when people speak up. And I want to encourage also all the other member states to do the same. I understand the, ri the risks in diplomacy, um, but nothing is worse than the risks of impunity. So thank you. Can everyone hear us now? Lina, can you? How are you? It is, uh, I just want to ask you the first question. Uh, you told us that uh, uh, your sister has been in solitary confinement since uh, uh, April this year. Is th but when was the last time you saw her? Uh, I saw her was, um, the, the last time I saw her was when is I was in Saudi Arabia. So it was back in 2000, December 2017. But what I must say is that when I tell you that we really do see changes when we speak up is that uh, first, my parents weren't allowed to have any visits. Then they started having visits. Then we started speaking up and they allowed more visits and more calls. So yes, my parents now, um, they talk to her once a week. And three weeks ago, the visits were only once a month. Um, and now they are once a week. So yes, uh, they see her often now. Okay. And uh, are there any news? How how is she? Is, uh, I mean, how how has uh, how is the situation? The last time you <coughs> heard. Lujin is a very strong person. I mean, she has hope, and she knows that what she's doing is the right thing. Um, she she was proposed in August. Uh, the the last news we had from the the, the authorities was they proposed to her to deny the torture uh, publicly. Um, she refused, and so this also made a lot of uh, this made a lot of uh, this made a lot of um, sound in the I mean vo noise in the newspapers, etc. But since we don't have any news, I mean I don't know what uh, the the procedure is. There is uh, we don't have any information. Saudi authorities won't talk to us, so there's really a gap between us and them. And Lujan is just waiting endlessly. Uh, what is the situation with the case against her. I mean, it, it sounds, uh, sometimes it sounds like there were charges being brought forward, but there's no, uh, like, uh, uh, like trial. And, oh, I mean, w w what, the, what is the situation there? And, and what, do you, what would you like that would happen? I think it's, the, the trial is not a real one because first when they arrested her, uh, when they said that the, the, there was going to be a trial, they said oh, we, we will uh, bring you to the terrorism court. Then people um, talked and then they said, oh no, actually we're not going to bring you to the, criminal, uh, to the terrorism court, we're going to bring you to the criminal court. And so since the beginning the procedure is not respected and now there, again the, there is a lack of transparency, there is a lack of um, respect of uh, procedures. So. And the decisions are really impulsive and we are, are unexpected, so I can't even say what tomorrow will bring. Okay. Uh, 
of course, uh, Lu Jane, she had become a well-known activist for women's rights in Saudi Arabia, like you described in your here in your speech. Were you comfortable with her advocacy at the time? Were you worried that something might happen to her? At the very beginning, so when we were talking about 2013, we knew what the red lines uh, were, and she knew that by driving she would uh, face consequences, but it wasn't that bad. I mean, she, she, in her video where she tries to cross the border, she says, let's see what happens. But then in 2018, she, she wasn't doing anything wrong or illegal or anything, and she was kidnapped and tortured. And so now there's something where we don't know where the red lines are, is we don't know where their red lines are. They, they there's a uh, impunity that makes them do the the, the unimaginable. Unimag and um, I would say now we don't know what um, what to do not to be not to cross the red line. They don't want us to cross. But you don't know really where the red line is today. We don't that's know what that's that. That's the yeah, the exactly. Of the problem, yeah. Exactly. Uh, Obviously, the situation is, is very precarious and even dangerous. And uh, are you putting yourself at risk by advocating for your sister? Or even are you putting her at more risk? <coughs> um, myself, I would say no, because uh, I, I'm in <laughs> these states and it's quite um, safe. But my, pa my family are all on a travel ban. So maybe it could harm them. But what I know is that silence didn't help my sister and I cannot remain silent anymore. No. Uh, just about your family, I mean, uh, how, ma obviously you are not, uh, you, you won't be going to Saudi Arabia anytime soon, but uh, I your family is in Saudi Arabia still. Yes, they, they, they're on a travel ban. So when Lujen was kidnapped in, uh, in um, March 2018, they put uh, the, the family on a travel ban, and which is, made without any official decision, and uh, we don't know w where these decisions come from. Is Lou Jane's case unique, or are there more women in Saudi prisons uh, for, for the same reasons? I mean, Lou Jane's uh, case is just emblematic because she's been known about, but there are cases that are worse, I would say, because they're not even activists like Lujain. Maybe you could understand Lujain was uh, asking for things. Some people just for a tweet are in prison. Mm -hmm. So Lujain's case is just um, taking a lot of the media coverage, but there are so much worse cases where because the family can't speak, um, no one knows about it. Just a little bit about your campaign. Uh, when did you start and uh, what was like the the key factor that you uh, that you you began your advocacy not uh, of obviously that your sister is in prison but was there anything in particular that mm. that made you raise your voice uh, at the beginning if you saw the timeline Lujain was arrested one month before they allowed women to drive so we really thought oh maybe there's there's a link and we'll wait till women are dr drive and we'll see how things happen and then months passed and then we um, we find we find out about tor the torture. My parents tell us about the torture, and I said, "Okay, it's not. We can't stay silent anymore. I mean, they they won't stop torturing her if we don't speak up." And that's really the the, the moment where we, we said, "Okay, now we're going to write an article about the torture, and um, when we're invited, we'll speak about it because the problem is much larger than just Lujain being in prison." Um. How is it going? How, I mean, do you travel a lot or, or, or speak at uh, conferences like this? Or, uh, I mean, how do you campaign for, for your sister? Yes, basically, I, I talk about it and I hope that when I speak, people will, al will also talk about it afterwards. So, yes. And how is it going? Is it, uh, are you getting more ears or is it uh, a struggle? I think it's from time to time. I mean, Saudi Arabia has to do something and then people will talk about it. And um, But yeah, people forget easily and that's why I have to, to keep on pushing. Yeah, exactly. That uh, you, you, you mentioned that in your, in your speech uh, briefly, that the Saudi authorities, they have in recent months announced certain decisions that could be seen as moving towards better human rights for its citizens. Uh, uh, lifting the driving ban is, is one. But... Uh, do you think these are made out of genuine interest in improving the human rights situation, but or are they solely a response to recent inter international criticism? I think they're a response to 
the Saudi citizens' demands first, because we see that the feminist movement is really strong in Saudi Arabia now, and um, it had to happen. They, 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 they wouldn't just um, not give this right to women. And also about the male guardianship system, there are so many things that sh need to be changed, but because the people don't know about the problems, they're not changed. So I don't think it's um, it's uh, out of, um, you know, just, um, I, I think it's good changes, but so much has to, to, to be done. And um, most importantly, we have also to, to have um, an institutional state because now it's just a police state and it's very scary. You participated in side events at the Human Rights Council in Geneva uh, this September. Uh, uh, September saw another joint statement in the Council by the group uh, by a group of, of concerned countries following from the earlier joint statement that Iceland led in March. Uh, does the fact that a group of states have this year been finally raising the concerns for human rights in Saudi Arabia, does that, uh, uh, do you think that has made any difference? I think yes, and I would like to thank Iceland and uh, Australia again. I think it really does make a, a difference. I mean, you, you can't not make uh, have an impact when you you are, you are being criticized all the whole, all the time. So I think we have to keep on uh, pressuring um, Saudi Arabia to release these activists and ask them if your ch changes are and reforms are real, then the ones who have been asking for them should be free and uh, enjoying them in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, can Iceland and Australia uh, and others in that forum do anything more or at the UN in general? What can be done more? What I think the thing is we, we shouldn't think it's a one-time shot and we have to keep on going in the, in the, the long term and never stop till uh, these activists are not um, freed. And just before we let you go, uh, for us here sitting in the room, I, th I think we've all been deeply moved by your, uh, by your story. Is there anything that we as individuals can do? Can we raise our voice or assist in any way? Of course, I think, I mean, there are always links to Saudi Arabia, and I think that every time there is something you should, um, as a, an individual, do, um, when there is an article, tweet about it and say that uh, you know if you are, um, if your reforms are real, then free them. We know that wha what's happening. You should also ask your government to um, to act. You have to to show that um, this new reforms won't be believed till uh, the ones who have been asking for them are freed and just show Saudi Arabia that we won't um, uh, trust you with uh, these reforms till um, the, the real human rights are respected. Mm. Thank you so much. You were, uh, because of the weather, you will be staying in Iceland slightly longer than you expected. <laughs> And you'll be on uh, national television as well, and uh, I'm sure everyone here is going to watch the interview there as well on, on Kastlusiv, whether it will be broadcast tonight or, or, the, or the next few nights. But uh, uh, thanks again for coming and, and uh, sharing your story with uh, us, the story of you and uh, your sister and your family and uh, Saudi women in general. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. For the second half of this uh, event, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'll be substituted now for my colleague, Maria Mjöll Jónsdóttir. Please take the, the, the gavel in the form of a microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can I also have your notes? Yes. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Again, thank you so much for being with us on this morning where we're preparing for this talk, actually. Um, I uh, have the honor to introduce our panelists today. Uh, unfortunately, due to the weather, uh, one of our panelists was not able to stay in the country. She was here for 12 hours. She's from the UK where the show Trapped has been really popular and she did not want to be trapped in <laughs> Iceland. So, uh, but we are lucky. We have uh, a distinguished uh, 
ambassador, Ambassador Michael Nevin of the UK, uh, resident here in Iceland, uh, who is uh, going to represent the UK in this panel. Um, and we also have uh, Kevin Whelan, who is the senior advocate at Amnesty International in Geneva. Then we have uh, Peter Villa, from, uh, former director of the Norwegian National Human Rights Institution. And last but not least, we have our very own Harald Aspelund, our permanent representative in Geneva, who has been vice president of the Human Rights Council for the last year or so. Can I please ask you to join me on the stage? I think we have our technical issues in order, is that correct? <coughs> Do you know? Because we have a slideshow. Is it ready? Yes. Sunna? Okay, we're good. So thank you so much. Thank you for traveling all the way here. Thank you for stepping up. Um, and thank you for being with us. Uh, I think we were going to start uh, with uh, Harald telling us a little bit about the journey. That's where the technical issues come in for us. So now we, if I can just give you the word, then you will take us through it and see if this all works. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Maria. Uh, well, first, uh, Vila, I thank you very much for being with us here today. Thank you. You hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Lina, for being with us here today. I admire your courage. Uh, yes, first, uh, why did Iceland become a member of the Human Rights Council? Um, how did it happen? Uh, to explain to you a little bit how it is for a representative of a, a small state like Iceland to... Uh, let's go. Sorry, uh, this is a snapshot of my uh, calendar, uh, the week of 17th of June, uh, 2018. And uh, it started like a normal week at the mission. Uh, most weeks are like that. Uh, on Monday, we had a class between the World Trade Organization and the uh, Human Rights Council, uh, as usual. Um, we had the Icelandic statement uh, in the trade policy review of Norway, our neighboring country, um, and the opening session of the Human Rights Council, uh, the June session at the same time. And um, it had also been decided uh, a month earlier that I would present my credentials as an ambassador to Switzerland um, on the 19th. And uh, I planned to uh, take the train in the afternoon to burn, to present my credentials um, in the morning of the, or in the afternoon of the Tuesday. Um, I plan to have a meeting in the afternoon with the chief of protocol. And, uh, but uh, we had uh, become um, uh, increasingly active as an observer in the council uh, before. And um, for instance, we decided in November 2017 to uh, make recommendations to all states uh, under review, under periodic review in the council, and we had been in the lead on some joint statements uh, also. One of these joint statements uh, ruined my plans that day. Um, that was the statement on the Philippines on Tuesday morning. And so I had to take the train back to Geneva that night. I delivered the statement on the Philippines in the morning. Uh, I took the train back to Burn in the afternoon, presented my credentials, and then took the train back at night. And on the uh, train, I was browsing the news, uh, I saw this. The United States had decided to leave the Human Rights Council. And uh, in the morning after, a uh, few of our colleagues at the Human Rights Council uh, 
uh, asked our human rights expert Edda if Iceland had any intentions to step in. Uh, I informed the ministry uh, that later, uh, and, and late that night uh, I got instructions from my minister through this guy, our permanent secretary Sturla, that I should indicate that Iceland would be willing to step in if others, other members of our regional group would agree. And um, the question came up in, in a way of meeting, the regional group meeting the morning after at nine o'clock. And uh, I said that uh, Iceland would be willing to do it. And um, I was the first to speak. And uh, this is also a kind of one good example on how small states can operate uh, and why we can be, uh, play an important role in the system. We move fast. And, um, wow. <laughs> uh, but again, uh, we have conflicts in our calendars all the time and I flew back to Iceland uh, for that weekend uh, for a ministerial meeting of the European Free Trade Association, which took place in Söderkrókur. And um, um, we knew that uh, we could never replace the United States uh, with all its capacity and, and, and uh, background in shaping the playing field for multilateral cooperation. Um, but we knew that we could play an important role there, uh, but a different role as a small state. And we decided that this was a good opportunity to prove it and, and, and show that small state could do something. Um, um, and as a small state, we need to prioritize. And we, when we became a member, we didn't have the months to prepare like most states do have. And uh, also for drafting our pledge, which is a, a document that, uh, that uh, explains what we aim to achieve in the council. And, um, but as I said, um, small states do move fast. And uh, Vardi, our human rights expert uh, in New York, he made the first draft of this pledge that weekend and uh, I place him there in the corner because he usually works at night. Um, I'm, I'm working in the morning most of the time. <laughs> uh, and we presented our pledge that week after the weekend and two weeks later we became formally elected as a member of the Human Rights Council. And then we moved fast again and moved Vardi from New York to Geneva. And I, I know now that the uh, diplomatic community in Geneva agrees with me when I say that um, Vardi and Sandra, our other human rights expert, uh, did a great job in Geneva uh, as a team. And thanks to them and uh, Davi Loye, who is here in the room, uh, he has been uh, here in Reykjavik, uh, um, I believe that I, I could say that uh, that with the end of the year approaching now that, that, uh, that I think we did okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, this is one of the privileges of, of uh, being a diplomat that you never know what's gonna happen <laughs> when you wake up in the morning, <laughs> what the day is gonna bring. Uh, so uh, you have spoken a little bit about uh, how we were able to do this because we're a small state, but here we have a, a bigger state who's also played a, a very large role and been on the council uh, with us and, and we know uh, we have received a lot of support from the UK in our work. Can you tell us a little bit, Michael, about uh, sort of your approach to the council and maybe even human rights in, in general? Um, yes, hope you can hear me. Um, I am an imposter. Um, Rita was meant to be here. She was our, um, our first international human rights ambassador um, that we have created that position, which I think speaks to um, the emphasis that we, that we have. That would also have changed the gender balance on this um, uh, podium <laughs> as well. So uh, please take me as, as a, a woman for this um, particular uh, session. But um, for us, I suppose, uh, we are now uh, globally, we have the third largest diplomatic presence. Um, and I would say nearly all posts will have some kind of human rights objective in their uh, business plans uh, for, for every year. And the system, the international system, is very much part of 
um, what we see as the rules-based um, international system. So a system which is based on rules uh, and fairness and creates um, a global order uh, of which human rights is absolutely central. Uh, and central to that is uh, the Human Rights Council. And we devote uh, a lot of emphases uh, in terms of our staffing uh, in Geneva, but also that connection out to our embassies where we are um, uh, feeding back what is happening in particular countries or in particular themes into London, but also into Geneva and vice versa. Um, so it's, it's meant to be a seamless uh, operation which focuses um, on human rights. Um, and clearly, when you are a, a large state, as you put it, um, with a global representation, then your, your advantage is one, capacity, but two, also uh, analysis, you know, what is going on. Uh, and three, hopefully, um, uh, leverage and lobbying, being able to lobby uh, in country uh, as well. Um, but, uh, as your minister said, uh, every state is a sovereign state and every state is equal. Um, so there may even be advantages to <coughs> being called a small state because um, if you take uh, the two resolutions which you uh, took forward, um, I'm sure there was some surprise in the capitals of those countries that Iceland is, is doing this. And in effect, um, that surprise maybe uh, has more impact, uh, perhaps. So with us, uh, we will uh, drive forward a number of resolutions, country resolutions as well as thematic resolutions, because um, very much we see it as, as part of uh, the global interest. However, for some countries, they may see this as uh, their big boys, uh, just having a go at uh, some other countries. Um, whereas I think with uh, a country like Iceland stepping up and um, being brave to, to take the lead, uh, it can have more impact because that charge uh, can't be laid uh, at your door. Um, so I think um, for us, uh, working with countries um, which are prepared to take the lead uh, is very valuable. Um, and rather than just the usual suspects um, uh, uh, taking things forward uh, globally uh, within the Human Rights Council, it's very valuable to have other countries stepping up because in that sense, it, it has more impact. Thank you. Um, uh, and thank you for you know, encouraging uh, small states to continue working there. Um, certainly, there's a lot of uh, sort of Human Rights Council specific words that we use here today. Um, and a lot of, uh, so I don't know if the audience is, uh, you know, familiar with the workings of the Human Rights Council, but perhaps there's, a, you can tell us a little bit about, uh, Kevin, the role of uh, the NGOs and, and what all this sort of language that we use, what it all means on the ground a little bit? Sure, sure, <laughs> I'm, I'd be happy to, but before I, I answer that, I might just want to start by um, thanking Iceland for uh, c creating this event and this space for reflection. I think oftentimes, <laughs> We have uh, a lot of discussion when a, a state is seeking election or selection to the council about what the pledges are, what do they want to do. Um, there are fewer opportunities for reflection at the end of a term, um, and I think that's equally important to try to distill what may have worked, what hasn't, how to continue engagement with the Human Rights Council. Um, so that's my first um, comment. Uh, the second thing I would like to do uh, before I go in is, is just to push back a little bit on the framing of this event, if you don't mind. So we're talking here about small states, um, but think, um, you know, poets, politicians, parents, all understand that, that words matter and they have uh, particular connotations. And I would just like to push back and say that, that no state I is small. Um, and I say that as a factual matter and I say that as a normative matter. Um, uh, you know, a car is small. <laughs> Our car can be small. A house can be small. A state is not a small thing. Uh, it's a large thing. Uh, uh, 
with, uh, with the ability to engage in the Human Rights Council as a co-equal with other states, um, with ministries, with experts, uh, with the ability to engage uh, in principle on a, a wide variety of issues. Um, but I also say, and as a normal, normative matter, is uh, no state can hide, right? No state can say, no, no state has a right to feel small, I, I would say. Um, you know, if you're locked up in prison, uh, in solitary confinement, uh, and you don't know if the world is watching, then you have a right to feel small. We can understand. Um, but I think uh, it's really important to, to keep that in mind as, as we engage, that any state that is engaging in the multilateral system, that is um, seeking membership in the Human Rights Council, has an obligation to, to meet and, and, and to stand up um, and to engage in principle uh, based on human rights considerations. And so I think we're gonna be talking a little bit about, I think maybe the relative advantages and maybe some strategy between big states and small states. But you know, before we get into any of that, I just want to emphasize that, um, that all states have massive responsibilities and we hope that they, um, they, they, will, they will meet them um, even when it's difficult. Um, so maybe to talk back about, uh, reflect a little bit about your question. Okay, so what is the Human Rights Council? Why does it matter? Why do we engage? Why does an organization like Amnesty engage in the Human Rights Council? Um, first of all, I would say that there, it's not just uh, my organization uh, that uh, engages in the Human Rights Council. There's many other civil society organizations that engage. There are many individuals that engage, um, human rights defenders. Um, you know, why do we come to the council? Why do we come to Geneva? Um, one thing uh, I would say at the top is because uh, it's an important space. Um, it is part of the UN human rights system where there has been a norm generating function and a norm maintaining function. This is the system from which the, the treaties, the human rights treaties have come. This is the system from which uh, the, um, you, uh, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights has come. Um, and uh, you know, these are the foundations of our common understanding of what everybody's entitled to. And it's not a static space, it's a contested space. Every day there, there, are, there are people seeking to uh, change that dynamic for their own interests, to dilute human rights, to promote human rights. Um, and I think, you know, first and foremost, that's one of the major reasons why we're there, because you ignore a space like this at your peril. Um, and, you know, beyond sort of the norm generating, norm maintaining function, this is a space where you can draw the world's attention um, to <coughs> issues of, of, of major concern. Um, you can uh, engage with uh, uh, experts, you can engage with um, diplomats in terms of passing along information, um, in terms of uh, advocating for certain outcomes in the system, uh, the creation of a joint statement which might um, draw the world's attention to, 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 to something that the world isn't but should be paying attention to. <coughs> it's a way for, uh, to establish um, an independent mechanism that might investigate into uh, you know, a, a, an area where perhaps we don't know what all the facts are and we know that there might be sort of a politicized contested area. Well, let's create an independent mechanism of experts. Let's have them do a report, report back to the council, and then you can't say it's X state or Y state or this uh, organization with an agenda. Then you can say this is, this is an independent United Nations body that's, that's making a, a determination. Um, and maybe another uh, thing that the Human Rights Council can do is uh, in addition to that, uh, it can create a space where not only can we, um, uh, let's say, share with the world what is happening now, um, but it also gives opportunity for mechanisms that might preserve evidence of wrongdoing or crimes um, so, that, uh, so that even if there might not be the, the, the prospect for accountability tomorrow, that in the long run, people know that um, facts are being preserved, uh, cr evidence is being preserved, people are watching, and you might get away with it today, but maybe not, maybe not in 10 years. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think uh, maybe just in sum, 
it's, it's a large system. It's not just the Human Rights Council. There's many expert bodies. Um, but there is a process of engaging through these um, mechanisms to prevent violations um, so that they simply don't occur. There is um, a process to draw attention to situations that are happening now. And there is, a, there is an opportunity to work for long-term accountability in this space. Thank you. Uh, so it's, you know, many small steps sort of forward, hopefully? Yeah. It, 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 <laughs> yes, I mean, it's a, it, it, it's a complicated and it's a political, uh, it's, a, it's a political entity of the UN, so it's not, it's not perfect. Um, we can talk about many areas of the council where important work is being done uh, and continues to be done. I think we engage with the council because we believe that it is important and as a balance, uh, we're making, we're making uh, progress uh, on, on, on important files. Of course, um, you know, there are, there, there are uh, situations which the council hasn't adequately addressed. Um, but I think the answer to that is not walk away, it's okay, let's try to figure out a principled way. Um, you know, we've made progress on these situations. How do we um, continue to make progress on those situations? And how do we identify um, a, a path forward on situations which may not yet um, have received a full consideration of the council? Thank you. Peter. You have a long experience from international human rights, engaging in, in, in both diplomatic functions and uh, nationally as well, uh, as a head of the National Human Rights Institute. Yep. Uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, about what are your thoughts about the Nordic perspective and how the Nordics can engage uh, yeah. together and, and in this whole, and in cooperation with others? Yeah, thank you, thank you. But uh, let me, like Kevin, also start by saying that uh, I really appreciate this initiative. So thank you for taking it. And also thank you for focusing on the role of small states in the Human Rights Council. I think that is very important that we, we have that on the agenda. Uh, yes, uh, the Nordic states. I think the Nordics has for long been a brand in the UN. Many people talk about the Nordics as, you know, a, a voice from relatively small states that uh, have uh, uh, where democracy, rule of law, and human rights have a very high standing. So we have a, we have a good position in the UN to, to make a difference, to influence. And I think that also we have an advantage in that we are, I have never been accused of having an, a political agenda or a hidden agenda behind the initiatives we have taken. So uh, I think that is a great advantage for the Nordics in the UN. And, um, and another uh, advantage is also that we have no enemies. <laughs> because very often, if you see that some states take initiatives in the UN, they are accused of, aha, so you are, it's to crack down on somebody, uh, an enemy state, or, uh, or you have a polit hidden political agenda. We, we don't. And as you said, uh, that uh, you know, you, we wanted to make a difference. We wanted to fight for promoting human rights. And, that, and I think that's how the world sees us. But also that uh, I know that very often small states say that, yes, but it demands a lot of resources to be in involved and to be a member of the Human Rights Council. Yes, it does. But I think it's easier for small states to, you know, to prioritize. You don't have to be everywhere. I think that uh, the biggest states, they have to be everywhere. And, but we, we can prioritize, it's easier for us. And we have a burden sharing, since you focused on the Nordics. We have for many decades had a kind of burden sharing in the, U, in the UN. That, you know, that let's say Denmark is the front runner on uh, torture. Uh, we have Finland, Sweden on summary arbitrary executions. Norway, human rights defenders, just to mention some. So I think that is also something that we help each other, the Nordics. Exactly. So um, I think we, um, uh, even though now one, uh, there might be a challenge that, you know, Norway and Iceland are not members of the EU, the rest are. But I, I don't think that it's a great <coughs> impediment. We can still keep the Nordic cooperation high on the agenda. And I hope we will do that. We, maybe I should also say that we, we have very few constraints 
when we get involved in human rights issues, we can be genuine human rights defenders. We don't have to look to all these political considerations that some bigger states have to take. Yeah, so we're just a free year. We are free year. To, to be able to yes. Uh, uh, yes. advocate for what yeah. you think is yeah. right, our values. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, uh, I think uh, regarding the priorities, as you say, uh, yeah. as a smaller state, <laughs> um, we, yeah. of course, had to prioritize. And uh, can you go through the uh, priorities and how we sort of were able to follow up on what we started with? Yes, thank you. Uh, or not so big state, as you say. No, not so <laughs> big state, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, we had already uh, been quite active in the council um, as an observer, and we had already kind of framed some priorities as an observer. And, um, and um, there are uh, regret regret regrettably some fundamental human rights that, that some states do not respect, and, and we uh, decided, decided uh, to try to play a, a responsible role uh, as, as not so large states um, uh, and focus on few of them. And, and um, there are mainly uh, three basic uh, rights that we have been focusing on, and, and uh, one of the most fundamental human rights is, is um, that all human beings are born equal. Um, and we know that men and women are not born equal, and um, uh, not even by law in, in some states. So we decided to, um, to fight for women's rights, uh, and the same goes for LGBTI uh, people's rights. Um, another basic right is the right to life. Um, and strange enough, uh, this fundamental right that we all have to stay alive is not respected by all states, uh, which are still executing their people. And uh, therefore, we uh, decided to, uh, to fight against the death penalty uh, and extrajudicial killings. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we also uh, decided to fight uh, for your right to uh, express your opinion and um, to be able to uh, fight for your rights uh, without being at risk of being imprisoned uh, or, or harassed by your own servants, uh, your authorities. Um, and, um, but this right is, as we know, not respected uh, by all states. And um, um, for a small state, I, I, I need to use the word small state. I can't <laughs> go into the other thing, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, for a small state like Iceland, um, uh, the rule of law and, and well-functioning multilateral system is, is crucial. Um, a world where the strong, uh, um, uh, and large prevail can become dangerous for us, the, sm the smaller states. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's the reason for uh, uh, the system. Uh, the, uh, the, officer, uh, the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights is our closest partner. And um, we um, have been working with the system. We listen to uh, the system's advice and uh, recommendations. And, um, and in uh, that cooperation with the system, um, uh, prevention has been a priority for us. Um, because if we step in at an early stage, um, we can prevent so much suffering. And, um, but that's also tricky because uh, if you want to uh, prevent, you need to step in quite early. And um, <coughs> even uh, with states that, that uh, most would consider relatively well, well functioning at the time, it uh, can be politically difficult. Um, um, during these 18 months that we have been on the council, uh, it's a short period, normally stay, stay in there for, uh, for three years. Um, I believe we managed to take in all the boxes of our plans, and um, we have been focusing on these three fundamental rights, and, uh, mm -hmm. and we have definitely experienced the sensitivities of the preventive approach. Um, and, um, and in all these efforts, we have been very much aware of our limitations, and, and we have, uh, as a small state, uh, with a small capacity, and we have, all, on all issues, uh, tried to find allies among like-minded, uh, like the United Kingdom, and, and also from the civil society, like the Amnesty, uh, and we have had a very good co cooperation with our like-minded. Um, and um, I believe that jointly, uh, in a cooperation, uh, we expand our capacity. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned uh, specifically uh, the freedom of speech and, and the 
freedom of the media, uh, which uh, has been uh, something we've seen in the in the Philippines. We had uh, when we had Maria Ressa here, and uh, as the minister mentioned, uh, perhaps Michael, you can tell us a little bit. Uh, last year was a perilous year for journalists, and the UK and the, and Canada are focusing on. Uh, Sa the safety of journalists and, and, and freedom of the media. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, so um, I think uh, Rina mentioned impunity. Um, and I think the, the core of good governance is accountability. Um, and important to that is ensuring freedom of speech, freedom of opinion, um, and uh, the, the media is integral to shining a spotlight and ensuring that our, our leaders, our politicians, our, our governments um, are accountable for their policies and for their actions. Uh, and as you said, uh, it was a terrible year for, for journalists um, uh, in 2017, 2018. Uh, I think something like 99 journalists were killed uh, around the world for doing their job. Um, and so. Uh, the UK, along with Canada, uh, decided that um, we need to do more to ensure uh, that the journalists are, are able to do the job, um, that they are protected, um, and that we shine a light on uh, those journalists who are being harassed, threatened um, uh, for their work. So uh, last year, um, sorry, this year in uh, the summer, in London, we, we held the, the Media Freedom Conference at which uh, your minister attended. Uh, and there was a pledge which uh, many countries signed up to, to. And that was a pledge to support um, journalists in a, in a kind of defense fund, but also uh, being prepared to step up, um, as you've done with the Philippines, uh, in particular cases, and shine a light on those cases, uh, and uh, put pressure on governments to uh, stop harassing um, journalists. Um, and this isn't a one-off, so Canada will host uh, the next one uh, next year. And in between, um, we will have regular uh, sessions. Uh, we want to uh, get the, the fund uh, deployed uh, in actually helping uh, human rights defenders and others to protect uh, journalists. Uh, but I go back to the core of what this is all about. Um, and what was said, is it, it is about accountability. The greater the accountability, uh, the less likely you're going to have human rights violations. Right. Um, Peter, can you give us also a little bit, uh, you know, with Canada and the UK actively yeah. engaged on this issue, um, how important is it to have, I'm so afraid of these, uh, big and small words now, uh, <laughs> that uh, to have the bigger, the major powers uh, involved in, in, in the work of the Human Rights Council and, yeah. yeah. I think everybody should be involved. Right. Yes, and both big and small and medium sized. And uh, because I think, uh, you know, and we have seen that, and that is something maybe that we should all be aware of, is that uh, if you go back a couple of decades, there were many states that, that were not involved in the work of the human rights, uh, UN human rights work. Uh, and uh, basically, the Western states, mm -hmm. Western European and North Americans were involved. But then, little by little, also many states with a different agenda came in. And I, since Saudi Arabia, I think if you go back more than 30 years, Saudi Arabia was not present in the fora, the human rights fora. Iran was not there, and many other states that have a completely different agenda from us. So that makes it even more important today, I think, that all states that want to fight, that are real human rights defenders, get involved. And also, let me just add there that I think that when you leave as a member, Many states, when they leave as a member, they, they leave. But I think it's very important that don't leave because you have an important role to play as an observer. And now you, have, you can get a flying start as observer because now you have the good contacts, you have the good image, you have the expertise, so, and you have a lot of possibilities also to continue 
being a very active observer. So that would be a, one of my messages to Iceland. Very good message uh, received, I guess. <laughs> um, lastly, before we turn to our commentators, perhaps uh, you can tell, tell us a little bit, uh, Kevin, in, in the day-to-day -day approach of Amnesty and other NGOs, how, how do you go about uh, influencing the, the agenda and how, how is your uh, cooperation with Iceland, for example, been uh, for the past 18 months? Um, okay, uh, happy to talk about that, but um, just I hope Peter doesn't mind, but um, because we've talked a little bit about the N Nordic record on the Human Rights Council, I would just like to offer my reflections a bit. Um, I think that um, the Nordics uh, in general have been quite strong um, when it's come to thematic resolution. So now at the country, at the Human Rights Council, there's, um, you can uh, pass resolutions that is on a particular theme, like extrajudicial executions. Mm -hmm. The council can create a special uh, rapporteur whose sole job it is to look at the issue of extrajudicial executions across the world, or torture. Um, and, and again, there have been quite uh, strong and sustained work by uh, Nordic countries on a number of themes, including human rights defenders and torture and other topics. I would say that um, uh, even if, let's say, there has been maybe more of a perception of independence, we haven't seen uh, the Nordics, um, let's say, be, uh, we haven't seen the rule to be Nordic stepping forward on difficult country specific situations. So I think you know, I would encourage, um, and this is why I think what Iceland did in uh, this year has been so positive, right? Because it's stepping forward, taking on two incredibly difficult files in the council, the Philippines and Saudi Arabia. Um, I think that there is more space um, for uh, the Nordics, um, both individually and together, to try to um, push difficult files, difficult country-specific files, forward, and only to also wholeheartedly agree with what Petter said about um, the, uh, the importance of continued engagement uh, when you're not a member of the council. So there is so much work that still has to be done. Um, uh, you know, the engagement, the work on the Philippines and Saudi doesn't stop now. It, it, it has to continue. Um, um, and, and so I would just uh, encourage uh, you to consider uh, uh, maintaining from, from, from very practical terms, um, uh, in, in terms of maintaining a, a strong presence in Geneva, to more high-level political terms, to, 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 to think actually that not being a member doesn't change much. Um, so again, it's a mind space, it's a mentality. Um, in terms of um, uh, am Amnesty's day-to-day -day work, I mean, I think, uh, so I am part of uh, our UN advocacy team, um, and we, uh, in effect, serve a liaison function. Um, we are working frequently with the researchers um, who are country specific or region specific, and those are the, those are the, those are the colleagues that are generating the reports um, and um, you know the central content, um, and then uh, also spending a lot of time engaging with um, colleagues in, in sections. Um, so I would say that you know the two groups of people within Amnesty that I spend most time dealing with are section colleagues, such as our colleagues uh, in Amnesty Iceland. Um, we have presence in, in in a number of countries across the world, um, and and with our researchers. And so what we are trying to do is take um, Amnesty, uh, you know, information um, campaigns, uh, advocacy, and through a coordination between researchers, our um, you know, our sections in, in countries and in our, um, you know, in Geneva to try to um, engage with uh, uh, experts in the system. So that would be uh, independent uh, experts, so like uh, a special rapporteur um, or uh, the OHCHR um, as an office or with states uh, to try to get things on the agenda that aren't, that we believe should be on the agenda, and to the extent that there are uh, things that are on the agenda to try to um, do our part to shape them in a way um, that, uh, that uh, adequately reflects the situation. Um, I think you know, we are not 
naive um, that um, all, all states, um, you know, the entirety of a state uh, is not the state's human rights department, right? There are other considerations at play. Um, you know, the four corners of our mandate are human rights. Um, and, you know, we, we serve um, to uh, try to maintain open lines of communication and we try to, um, you know, push, push states to do better. Um, when there's an opportunity for collaboration and when there's not an opportunity for cl collaboration, um, we try to um, draw as much uh, attention as possible to the situation to try to um, change the calculus of, of a government that they can't simply get away with something, that people are paying attention, that people are watching. Um, we try to engage with a broad range of states um, with greater or lesser uh, success. I would say that um, you know, in the context of our work with uh, uh, Iceland on Saudi Arabia, I think that that is um, that was excellent collaboration, um, and we uh, had a, and it's a testament to what can be done when you um, have, uh, let's say, a small group of people aligned around a similar uh, objective, um, and 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 an ability to um, you know work together. Um, so. Thank you, and thank you for the work that you do there. I know it's been very important to us. Yes. Better, you wanted yeah, to want, add? Yes, while agreeing with you, Kevin, that uh, we need a Nordic voice on difficult country situations. Yes, we do. But I also think it's important, and that has been encouraged by many Western states, that, that it's uh, that to get countries in the region concerned to take the lead on difficult country situations. That, that uh, for example, uh, an African state take the lead on an African country, a Latin American on. So we have also, uh, I know that Norway has encouraged that and many Western states have. And I think that is important so we don't get the kind of regional divide when it comes to country situations because we need to have, you know, that is a legitimate and necessary part of the Human Rights Council's work, country situations. Exactly. Just Yes, so please, Michael. Uh, mine's a quick one, um, and I know that there are members of parliament here, uh, as the rest of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but yeah. from the UK point of view, given uh, how Iceland has performed over the past 18 months, we would, A, encourage Iceland to continue, um, even though you're stepping out of the Human Rights Council, as we are, but B, consider running again for the Human Rights Council membership. Yes. yes. Did you want to add? Something? Just, just one point is that um, it, it, you know there are op there are times when um, states from a particular region might lead on a situation, but there are times when that doesn't happen. And Philippines yes. was a time when that didn't happen, yeah. and we needed a country like Iceland to be able to, even though they weren't part of that region, mm -hmm. to step out and say, well, no one in the region is doing it. Somebody yeah. needs to do it, and and that's going to be us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, I think we have reached the point where we would like to hear from our commentators. Uh, I think there's a microphone. Yes, indeed. Uh, first, we have uh, uh, Brindis Harastotir, uh, parliamentarian, uh, who, uh, and Smaury McCarthy, who's here also. Um, uh, perhaps I just give all of you, uh, sort of, uh, or at least the two of you, the same question, sort of. Uh, of course, what are your thoughts on, on today and, and what do you think that uh, on today's discussion and what do you think that our term has meant for us? What, how do we take it forward uh, from here, our human rights work? <coughs> Thank you for that. Where should I stand? It's kind of, um, can I stand here? Yes. Because it's like difficult to <laughs> have it back on you. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much for this conference. It was very interesting and actually because Smaury and I should be down in the parliament fighting about something that sounds like peanuts in this global mm -hmm. concert we are <laughs> discussing here. Um, and Lina, thank you so much for your speech. Um, it, I felt very emotional. I mean, I've read about this case and I've heard about it, but being here in the same room as you and hearing your story, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, very, very emotional. Thank you so much. You're so brave and your sister also. Um, what does this mean for us? Um, I think actually it was very important. It was also very nice to see this, how you went by the train and then something came up <laughs> because I'm sitting in the foreign committee and of course we, we were also announced that this might be happening and, and what you were doing. And I definitely this is something that we can do 
as not so big state, we <laughs> quite small state, so we can, we can move fast. And I think that is very, very important. Um, and I have to say, I, I am very proud of what we have been able to do uh, in this short time. I'm very proud of my minister, but because he has left, I know the job is all yours. <laughs> um, and I think it's very important for us. And I have to say, um, especially with the Philippines, I I've kind of felt it on my skin because we have quite many Philippines living here in Iceland, and some of them came up to me and I was quite worried. And even though a man uh, that's father of uh, one of my best friends is living in Philippines and he wrote a status on Facebook after the resolution where he kind of, he said he was shamed for Iceland because he was taking to try to stand in that sense. And because I think it's so important to know where people is coming from and try to understand what's going on. So I've tried to understand what is going on in the Philippines. And I understand in a way that it, the situation there was very bad. So I don't like wars, but I understand that people want to fight drugs. Uh, so in that sense, I think it's so important that we are standing up for human rights. We are not in a war or we are not fighting states. We are fighting for human rights. And I think that is so important in, in all this discussion. Um, did I answer your question or? More or less, yeah. I think you did fine. But like <laughs> Michael, uh, yes, I think Iceland should definitely continue to stand up for human rights. We try to do it in our foreign policy. It's, it's a, a backbone of our foreign policy and, and, and it will be. Um, and why not? Maybe we should consider later on to run again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, uh, you can choose a spot of your liking. <laughs> this one looks, looks pretty good. Uh, yeah, thank you for, for this event. And actually, it's, it's good uh, to, uh, I think this more is a retrospective than an autopsy uh, of our, our short time in the um, Human Rights Council. And, but it was very important, and I think we can all be very proud of the fact that Iceland stepped in to the United States' shoes at the time that we did. Uh, even if it's for a short while, because it gave us an opportunity to prove ourselves and it gave us an opportunity to maybe change the focus a little bit. But uh, I think the, to the uh, comment on small states, I think the, maybe a better way of framing it is less and more geopolitically dominant states. Because ultimately what it comes down to is the relative power that different countries have. And uh, the less geopolitically dominant states do have the ability to serve as a very strong moral authority as long as we're very careful not to sully ourselves either by behaving badly ourselves or by implicitly or explicitly supporting bad behavior of others, and that's including our, our good friends sometimes in the more geopolitically dominant states. Um, but uh, as to our uh, role in the Human Rights Council, I think we need to keep, bear in mind that there are a lot of very important, less glamorous roles than the Human Rights Council per se that do need our attention. And uh, we should be keeping those in mind, maybe uh, contributing to them. And also remembering that um, uh, the human rights are not just influenced by attitudes and political opinions each time, but also by socioeconomic outcomes. And when we're looking at, at the global uh, setting where um, less developed states uh, are being, well, uh, illicit outflows to the tune of 120 billion, no, sorry, $1,200 billion per year uh, in just illicit outflows from less developed countries. Uh, then, and you combine that with con uh, topics such as deforestation, uh, desertification, and so on, then it's very easy to see ways in which we can help human rights without necessarily just focusing on the political messaging. Because even though the political messaging matters and we've done well in that, uh, there are maybe more hands-on ways that we can contribute. Um, and and to, that, uh, to counter that, my own point there, people sometimes think of human rights as soft, and they're absolutely not. Uh, at the end of the day, they are the bedrock that we base a lot of our 
uh, ability to live on, especially if you are living in countries where human rights are not respected. And so making sure that everybody has that bedrock and it doesn't fail people is very important. So I, I think just to summarize, I, I think um, Iceland should definitely continue on the path it has started on, uh, should do more, should uh, widen the horizons, but at the same time choose focused topics, not just try to do everything and fail. Um, but remember the big context and always look for the opportunities to, um, with the small amount of effort that a less geopolitically dominant country has, uh, try to look for the opportunities to make disproportionately large effects. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, I think we have a lot to think about. Um, we also have with us today um, Kauri. Well, Swain's notes don't have his last name. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll have to introduce yourself. Um, yeah, but uh, so um, you are a scholar here in, in Iceland. Um, what, this, is, this has been a very sort of practitioner's, a practitioner's panel. Um, can you tell us a little bit about sort of your take on, on the whole thing, our term and this discussion? Right, uh, so the academic privilege is really to um, you know, pull away and step back and um, think about this in a slightly more abstract way maybe. Um, but before I do that, obviously thank you all for, thank you for coming over and, and for, for uh, this discussion. It's been really, really um, magnificent. And of course, thanks to our keynote speaker for her courage, her, her incredible story. Um, and so, so what, what this whole discussion made me really think about is, you know, what does this all tell us about maybe the state of human rights today um, as, a, as a tool, as a moral language, and as, as a, a series of institutions? Um, because it's, it's really this, this the, the situation of Iceland as a member of the, the, the council came up in a very strange time for human rights. Um, so, Michael said, I mean, even last year was, it was, can, can adequately be described as a terrible year for the enjoyment of at least some human rights. Uh, it also saw various types of backlash to human rights and to the multilateral system from states, not only the US leaving the, the council, uh, but various other states uh, that have, have adopted positions that are, are explicitly or at least implicitly hostile to the system we're talking about here. Um, the backlash is not merely limited to leaders of countries, but also to the public in some states, which, feel, which genuinely feel, we can disagree or agree about the, the, uh, whether it's a, uh, based, on, you know, based on facts or based on per perceptions, but that this system has somehow failed and it's been um, the idea of human rights and the tools of human rights have been captured by um, a quote-unquote elite that uh, doesn't deal with the, the issues of, of, of ordinary people. And so all of, this, all of these difficulties for human rights are happening. Uh, but at the same time, we keep looking to human rights as a way to address the, some of the m most complicated issues in the world. So be they geopolitically complicated or be they just huge. I mean, we, we talk about human rights and climate change. We look to human rights as potentially answering the, the stratification of, of economic classes and economic inequality. So both of those things are somehow happening at the same time. And then along comes Iceland and, and, and steps up. Um, and I think uh, I, it, it really, the, and at least this is true from, from my perception, is that uh, Iceland very much exceeded expectations with this seat on the council. Um, and I think the diplomats involved did a terrific job with limited resources and, uh, you know, no, almost no lead up to the whole thing. Uh, so just, just in, incredibly, incredibly, um, you know, good work, quality work. And it tells us something about 
human rights and the institutions that they, they at least we know that the council continue to function without the US, uh, whatever may happen in the, in the future. And I want to touch on just a, po a point that some of you have raised about the abilities of, of, of states like Iceland which can come in and, and um, sort of take a principled stance because they're genuinely seen and, and most of the time correctly seen as sort of having no ulterior motives. But still, I think we just we need to remind ourselves that also Iceland provides in this, as in so many other cases, just a sort of a microcosm of what other states also deal with. So it's not as if there are no <coughs> complicated politics involved uh, in Iceland. And uh, even when they concern human rights you know, and human rights as an export, which is sort of what we're trying to do right now. Uh, and this, you know, the, the prime example maybe is, is uh, the criticism or the backlash faced by the Icelandic authorities um, over um, economic sanctions against Russia. So uh, the Icelandic government has, to its credit, stood firm in that, um, in the, in, in that case. But it just demonstrates that, that, yes, there will be politics involved, there will be economic interests on the other side in some sense. And um, small states, just like large states, do have to manage those. And sometimes they, they do and sometimes they, they, they fail. So I think for the future we should be, you know, we should be optimistic that we can do this. Iceland can, can, can surely do this and it can even have a, an impact. But um, all the people involved, and especially you know, people with the privilege of, of my position, will still continue to be, uh, think critically about the whole endeavor and, and think what are the limits of what we're trying to do. Uh, and, and, and you know, it's probably not enough to do only this, but it's, it's, uh, we already know that it's surely worth doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we can leave it here. We have a lot to think about. We have uh, to decide what we're going to do in the future. Harald? Uh, and uh, uh, thank you all for kind words and informative uh, comments here today. Uh, Lina, again, you've inspired us. And uh, thank you all for braving the weather. <laughs> and I wish you a quiet afternoon at home today. And thank you for coming. One, th one more thing. Do a round. Yes, do you? I, I'm, I've almost finished, sort of put an end to all of this. But, <laughs> but if, if you want to ha make a comment, please. Um, yeah, I'll just pick up on, um, you're right, um, that, that um, uh, it can, we have many interests as a UK in most of the countries around the world, um, and uh, those interests can be broad, they can be narrow depending on, on the country, um, but I think we, we would also go back to our fundamentals, which is one, uh, human rights are fundamental, but also um, it is in our interests that uh, human rights are integral to good governance, because for us, good governance means <coughs> that um, uh, we can trade more easily, uh, we don't have to spend so much money on security or defense or aid or whatever. But equally, um, in our aid budgets, in our foreign office budgets, um, the work that we do on security, actually the human rights is uh, integral to that and a lot of funding goes towards it. So whilst we recognize there are tensions sometimes between our interests, we also recognize that fundamentally, uh, the better governed a country becomes, then the better um, for us as well. Um, yeah, and maybe just to pick up on the idea that there might be some sort of glamorous subjects and not some that, that aren't as glamorous. I mean, I think the, the point is that the human rights system is much bigger than country-specific resolutions. It's much bigger than a particular uh, uh, you know, uh, 
resolution, and and there are uh, there's a lot to be of work to be done on the thematic level, um, you know, economic, social, cultural rights, climate change, and the like. And I think the solution is to address both. Right? It's not it's not one or the other. Um, and um, maybe also just to to add some reflections on the fact that you know there there is always a sort of politics, there are always constraints. Um, and, and you know, we have no illusions that human rights is a, is a, is a, um, it's a UN body made up of states, which are political entities. Um, and so, uh, you know, th there are always going to be challenges. Um, and I think, you know, one way to address that um, is to, um, to make politics secondary, is to articulate a set of principles by which um, states will engage Sort of, sort of objective criteria is, is some of the language that's used in Geneva. You know, when A, B, and C, and D happen, then we are going to step forward, even if it's a difficult situation, even if it's a country where we have ties, right? So then it becomes not about country A against country B. It becomes about the principles. It becomes about, okay, this is what we said we were gonna do even when it's hard. Um, and you know, when you have the difficult country conversation with another with another country, it's not about our bilateral relationship. It's about these principles. And you know, if there's a change, then the response will be different. But um, I think there's there is work that's being done in Geneva uh, around what is called in Geneva the objective criteria. I think those principles have been pretty well articulated. I think we still have a challenge in figuring out how we operationalize them. Um, and so I think that's that's something where perhaps I think Iceland and other Nordic countries um, could uh, have a role to play going forward. Anything to add? Just a couple of points. First, I, th I think that uh, we need to keep human rights high on the agenda, maybe now more than the last decades. And I, I took a quote here from the from Freedom House. I'm, I'm sure you can't read it, but freedom in the world has recorded a global decline in political rights and civil liberties for 13 consecutive years from 2005 to 18. So, you know, so that is, uh, so there are very bad signs in the horizon. And I think another bad sign is also that, that some, you know, countries with an, an agenda very different from ours are becoming more and more active in the UN. Uh, of course, it's important that everybody gets uh, are active in the UN, but I think we have to counter that. We have to be active as well. And, uh, and for small countries, maybe <laughs> I should stop using small countries, our countries, we, uh, we have learned that you know, a well-functioning multilateral system is a guarantee for us. And also that the international human rights system is a kind of collective guarantee for stability, not only for upholding human rights, but also for stability in the world. So uh, keep up the good work. Good, good work. Yes, thank you, and um, I thank you all for being here, and, and I also thank for the kind words. Uh, it's, it's very encouraging to have positive feedback on what you're doing, and I will definitely convey that message to my people in, in Geneva, uh, who have been working day and night on this, uh, but I will also tell them that the job is not done. Well, allow me to wrap it up again. Thank you all. You want to say something? <laughs> well, we need some housekeeping uh, before we finish because Karen made excellent points there earlier. And I just wanted to give you the, his full name and title. And his name is Kauri Holmar Ragnarsson. He's an SGD candidate of Harvard Law School and member of the Human Rights Institute of the University of Iceland. Thank you for your good points. And uh, to all of you, it was, it's been excellent to, to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you.